It's a great honor and privilege to be able to give this presentation to you all today. The title of my presentation is The Architectural Experience of the Mormon Temple Ritual Drama. Connections to Jewish and Catholic Ritual Contexts and Sacred History. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whose members are often referred to as Mormons, has been characterized as one of the fastest growing Christian faiths in the world. The Church's growth is especially connected with the built environment. In fact, in 2009, the Church was on track to build more building square footage than Walmart. This seems to confirm the suggestion of one scholar who writes that Mormonism is an intensely American story and also one intimately associated with the molding of a physical environment. This type of environmental growth may have been a reason why sociologist of religion Max Weber calls Mormonism halfway between monastery and factory. The Mormon temple is often referred to as a house of learning because one of the main rites comprises a symbolic ritual drama called the endowment. Religious scholar Douglas Davies explains, the temple is a kind of educational environment, teaching by action and educating through ritual. The symbolic and ritualistic learning experiences involve the physical, aesthetic, intellectual, and spiritual human faculties as portrayed through art, drama, symbols, and scriptural representations. The Mormon temple experience therefore places a high priority on visual aesthetics since both art and architecture were developed to convey a world of beauty and transcendence where time and eternity might interpenetrate. Over the past 20 years, Mormon temples have more than doubled in number and closely paralleled the increase in church membership. Yet the architectural experience of the temple remains misunderstood and misinterpreted because of its inaccessibility to non-Mormon scholars. However, the more frequent construction of temple, temples, uh, public open houses, and uh, temple-related publications has opened up new research opportunities for scholars. In an effort to take advantage of these opportunities, this paper addresses the architectural experience of the Mormon Temple Endowment and its ritual drama using comparisons to Jewish and Catholic ritual contexts and sacred history. The morphology of ritual architectural priorities outlined by Lindsay Jones in his book, The Hermeneutics of Sacred Architecture, is used to frame the cross-cultural and theological comparisons between architectural experiences. While the architectural configurations of each religion are formally and historically different, similarities become clear when ritual experience, religious ideals, narrative spatial sequence, and symbolic connections to cosmic history are compared synchronically. To start the comparative exercise, the five-room spatial sequence of the Mormon temple is used to frame the intriguing cross-sections between religions. Each room has a unique theme representing a specific period or episode within cosmic history, also known as the plan of salvation. However, since the terminology for Mormon temple rooms are typically unfamiliar to outsiders, such as the terms celestial, terrestrial, or telestial, I've expanded the definition of each theme to address a broader Judeo-Christian audience. This aligns the five themes under the following rubric. One, the cosmogonic primordial era. Two, the paradisical world of Eden. Three, the fallen disordered world. Four, the messianic paradisical era. And five, the perfected heavenly realm. The first episode in the comparative sequence is the cosmogonic primordial era. Several similar themes are interwoven between the three religions, including spiritual creation, darkness, formlessness, and pre-created light. 
The Latter-day Saint Temple Endowment Sequence begins in a space representing the primordial era, or pre-existent state before the Earth's creation. It is not ironic that it is named the Creation Room. In this space, initiates are taught a course of instruction which it includes a recital of the most prominent events of the creative period. An important part of this cosmogonic myth is the spiritual creation that occurred in heaven during a pre-existent state before the Earth's physical creation, a period when matter was unorganized. As part of this episode of sacred history, we find the council in heaven and in the book of Moses, we find the following scripture. For I, the Lord God, created all things of which I have spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. All things were before created, but spiritually were they created and made according to my word. For it was spiritual in the day that I created it, for it remaineth in the sphere in which I, God, created it. In the earliest temple configurations, <clears throat> creation rooms were simple, unadorned, and dimly lit, and reinforced the primordial era when the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon, uh, <clears throat> upon the face of the deep. Later, creation rooms adorned their entire walls with murals, scenes depicting the creation of heaven and earth, such as the creation room in the Los Angeles temple, which is in the shape of creation symbolism in the Vesica Pisces. The mural served as a symbolic message, suggesting how the earth's spiritual creation or blueprint was constructed in physical form. Similar to the Mormon endowment, creation accounts and symbolism played an important role in the liturgy of the Judaic temple. The Genesis creation account and the construction of the Mosaic tabernacle are both symbolically connected to one another. Temple scholar Margaret Barker explains that the six days of creation described in Genesis 1 are linked with the six stages of building the desert tabernacle. Within the tabernacle, the most holy place, known as the Holy Holies, or Debir, represented day one of creation when light emerged and was divided from darkness. Somewhat reminiscent of the early Mormon creation rooms, the Holy of Holies was a simple cube-shaped room kept in complete darkness and symbolized the primordial state and day one of creation. In Jewish literature, God's presence or dwelling place is often associated with light. This connection helps clarify how the Holy of Holies, although in the temple a place of darkness, was also symbolically the place of pre-created light. In the Apocalypse of Abraham, an angel guides Abraham in a heavenly ascent where he sees the firmament as a screen on which the history of his people is revealed to him. Similarly, in Third Enoch, our Ishmael, the high priest, was taken into heaven and shown all the history of the world on the reverse side of the veil, as though on a great screen. This included the whole panorama of the earth's history from creation to the end of the world. The creation story is important for Roman Catholic church architecture and liturgy. Similar to the Jewish temple, the Catholic Holy of Holies was also the place of heavenly light amidst darkness. This is especially apparent in the early Christian rituals at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The new Holy of Holies in this building was the Tomb of Christ and was called the Anastasius or cave of the resurrection. Part of the daily services included a ritual called the holy light or fire. 
the ritual required that all the lamps and candles were lit from a flame that was kept constantly burning in the cave. As time progressed, the Holy Sepulchre's holy light ritual refined its parallels to Jewish temple rites. Ideas from this ritual also carried over into the old Paschal Vigil of the Catholic ritual at Easter time. Another important example linking the Holy of Holies to darkness and light is found in Michelangelo's ceiling murals in the Sistine Chapel. His vision is truly cosmic and he begins the painting with God creating order from the primeval chaos separating night from day. It is not ironic that Michelangelo strategically locates day one of creation in the western Holy of Holies apse directly over the altar. Moving on to the second episode of Cosmic History. This era is comprised of the paradisal world of Eden. Themes common among the three faiths include symbolic trees, tropical vegetation, and cherubic gatekeepers. As Mormon initiates leave the creation room, they proceed upwards to an elevated ritual space called the garden room. This room represents the paradisiacal world of Eden, or terrestrial state, which existed when the Lord God finished the creative enterprise. In essence, earth was clothed with a physical body and passed through a veil. One scholar writes that the Salt Lake Temple garden room represented the earth as it was before sin entered and brought with it a curse. It is the Garden of Eden in miniature. Some temples even include a symbolic tree of life and tree of knowledge with its forbidden fruit that are used in the ritual drama. Of particular interest is the choreography of actors and patrons as it corresponds to the location of the two trees. We will later see how this spatial arrangement of genders, trees, and the relative directions of left and right parallel other Judeo-Christian precedents. The paradisical theme is evident in many garden rooms through the use of living plants and continuous floor-to-ceiling mural paintings. This tends to produce the feeling of a lush and oftentimes tropical garden. As Adam and Eve are being expelled from the Garden of Eden in the ritual drama, God places cherubim in a flaming sword to guard the way back into, the, into paradise and protecting the tree of life. This is represented visually in the Los Angeles Temple World Room murals showing Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden, which is protected by a flaming sword. Along the pathway from the Garden Room to the World Room in the Salt Lake Temple, initiates past a similar scene found in a Tiffany stained glass window depicting the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. In the Jewish temple, the holy place, Hekal, was similar to the nave of the Catholic Church with clear story windows and was placed between the Holy of Holies and the courtyard. In Second Enoch, we learn that paradise is in between the corruptible earth and the incorruptible heaven. This room provided a paradis paradisal backdrop for the priestly class and their rituals. The walls were ornamented with carvings of palm trees and flowers, which helped convey messages to the paradisal world of Eden. Consequently, the holy place is thought to represent the Garden of Eden. Elsewhere, the table of shewbread parallels the eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that took place within the Garden of Eden. This is clarified by a rabbinical text from the late period. Quote, the table is in the north, 
corresponding to the Garden of Eden, in which all sorts of pleasure are kept for the righteous. After Adam and Eve partake of the forbidden fruit, they are expelled eastward from the Garden of Eden. In this eastward movement, however, we must note the relative directions with the tree of knowledge on the left and tree of life on the right, just as in the Mormon garden room. The images of cherubim carved into walls, doors, and panels of the temple, as well as being embroidered into the veil, each played a similar role to those at Eden's gate. The cherubim functioned as divine sentinels, guarding the path leading to the presence of God, preventing the trespass by unauthorized persons. According to Donald Perry, this celestial blockage suggests that there existed an entrance to the garden established at the east end of the garden. Once more, the eastward orientation of the Mosaic Tabernacle and Jerusalem temples having entrance at the east reinforces the idea that the temple represented the Garden of Eden. The Edenic theme is likewise important for Catholic ritual context. Similar to the Jewish temple's holy place, the Catholic nave, according to Helen Ratner Dietz, stood for the earth, earthly paradise once lost by Adam, but now regained by Christ. The ceiling murals above the Sistine Chapel's nave link it to the Judaic understanding of the days of creation that pertain to the temple's holy place. As we recall, anything after day one of creation was believed to be part of the tangible, visible creation within the paradise, paradisal world of Eden before the fall. If this is the case, it may appear odd that Michelangelo's mural depicting the temptation and expulsion is located outside the holy place's original placement of the white marble partition. However, directly below this mural is a porphyry disc on the floor where the Pope himself knelt during many rites in the chapel before entering through the great portal. The ceiling attests that this spot was a symbolic gateway guarded by the cherubim and the flaming sword, the hinge by which the faithful passed through the paradisical Garden of Eden and its tree of life. With the nave representative of paradise, it is interesting to note the relative directions of left and right to the gender separation requirements of the early church. According to one early document, we read, Let the doorkeepers stand at the gate of men, and deaconesses at the gate of the women. St. Cyril also takes notice of this distinction as customary in his own church at Jerusalem, saying, quote, Let a separation be made that men be with men and women with women in the church. In the 6th century Basilica of St. Polinare Nuovo, the enthroned Christ and a group of male saints are on the right, with the Mother of the Lord and female saints on the left walls of the nave, relating closely to Christ being the new Adam and Mary as the new Eve. The next phase in cosmic history is called the fallen, disordered world. Often with the most stark contrast from the previous Edenic state, themes from this period include opposition, contention, enmity, chaos, desolate landscapes, sacrifice, sin, repentance, and a time before redemption. After Adam and Eve's fall and expulsion from the Garden of Eden, the sacred narrative leads the Mormon initiate into a space representing the fallen, disordered world. It is often called the world 
or telestial room because it represents the world we now live in and gives the impression of conflict in sharp contrast to the peace and harmony of the garden room. The purpose of the mural paintings is to instill in the participants a deep awareness of man's purpose on earth and his obligations and opportunities to rise above his present fallen status. This stage of the ritual drama has been described as Adam and Eve's condition in the lone and dreary world when doomed to live by labor and sweat after the fall. While in the garden, the couple was able to enjoy living in the presence of God. However, now they lived in a wicked world, a world shrouded in darkness, principally led, directed, governed, and controlled from first to last by the power of our common foe, the devil, writes Brigham Young. Eventually the time arrives for the need to rebuke and cast out Lucifer. As in Jesus' great temptation or Moses' encounter with Satan. And then to covenant to turn back to God. As Moses stated, Depart from me, Satan, for this one God only will I worship. In the name of the only begotten Son, depart hence, Satan. Similar to the Mormon tradition, Judaism held the world of Eden to be in stark contrast to the fallen, disordered world. Thus, when Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, they were no longer pure and innocent, but were cast out of the garden toward the east. While the cherubim and fiery whirling sword prevent re-entry to the garden, repentance and the atonement would provide a return to God's presence. In fact, Ezekiel's use of the Hebrew word shube for repent means to turn or return back to God. According to one apocryphal text, it is on the day in which Adam went forth from the garden that he offered as a sweet savor an offering in the morning with the rising of the sun from the day when he covered his shame. Moses' account is similar, but reveals the purpose of animal sacrifice. On that day in which Adam went forth from the garden, that he offered as a sweet savor an offering. Oh, excuse me. Why why dost thou offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Adam said unto him, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. And then the angel spake, saying, This thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father. With this we learn that the beginning beginning of the reversing of the effects of the fall occurs through an atoning sacrifice. The temple courtyard represented the fallen world in which Adam and Eve found themselves after their expulsion from paradise and their attempted reconciliation that took place just eastward of the Garden of Eden as the altar and labor were eastward of the holy place. In fact, in the Israelite sacrifice tradition, we find that a sacrifice was placed so as to face the west or the most holy place in order thus literally to bring it before the Lord. But the second rite of confession of sin turned the sacrifice so that the person confessing looked towards the west while he laid his hands between the horns of the sacrifice. For Catholics, Adam and Eve lost their home in paradise after they partook of the forbidden fruit, which created a need for humanity's redemption and reconciliation from original sin. Thus, Christianity is dominated by the yearning for paradise, writes Mircea Eliade. 
the solution was to be found in Jesus Christ's birth and atonement. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. In both the Eastern and the Western Church, the narthex or vestibule stood for this earth before redemption. Michelangelo's last three ceiling murals in the Sistine Chapel, corresponding to the less sacred vestibule outside of the marble partition, depict the fallen, disordered world before redemption. With close parallels to the temple gates at Jerusalem and the Garden of Eden being absolved and the Garden of Eden being absolved from sin at the narthex of the church and then entering the nave represents the return of the penitent into the presence of God. In the early Christian rites of initiation at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the baptistry's outer chamber was similar to the church's narthex because its symbolic associations to the fallen world of sin and darkness. It is here in the outer chamber that initiates faced westward, stretched out their hand, and renounced Satan as though to his face. After this enactment, initiates turned from west to east, the region of light, to get a glimpse into the baptistry or inner room which represented paradise. At this point, initiates were told the following, the gates of God's paradise are now open to you. That garden which God planted in the east and from which our first parents, parent was expelled for his transgression. The fourth episode, similar to the second, is called the Messianic Periodicycle Era. The symbolic themes comprise peace, tranquility, earthly paradise, resurrection, prayer at veils, and a Messiah figure. The second to last room in the spatial sequence of the Mormon endowment drama is called the terrestrial room and represents the world during the millennial period. In Mormon theology, the second coming of Jesus Christ ushers in a millennial era which causes the earth to be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. In other words, the earth is to go back to the primeval, paradisical, or terrestrial state that prevailed in the days of the Garden of Eden. The stage-like backdrops in Mormon terrestrial rooms provide a similar atmospheric mood of peace and order as garden rooms, but through different aesthetic strategies, including proportionately spaced engaged pilasters, large wall murals, uh, and two crystal chandeliers in the Salt Lake Temple to enhance the effect of spiritualism. And more recently, they have placed a large painting of Jesus and the Second Coming. While most terrestrial rooms do not have painted murals, the Alberta Canada Temple mural above the veil shows the Savior appearing to Mary following his resurrection and reinforces the messianic message that through Christ's resurrection, death shall be overcome, especially to those who rise in the morning of the first resurrection prior to the millennium. Two important features on all terrest of all terrestrial rooms include an altar and a curtain-like partition called the Veil of the Temple. In order to enter the final room, passage leads through the veil and is symbolic of the gate of heaven. Mormons interpret the veil of the temple with Christocentric symbolism, since it is through his atonement that the division between heaven and earth is penetrated. Often the acanthus leaf is also used in these settings as a symbol of resurrection and paradise. 
In Judaism, the progression back into the temple's central nave or holy place constitutes a return to the paradisiacal realm during the Messianic era. According to the Testament of Levi, access to the future paradisiacal world is made possible by the return of a messianic figure who reverses the effects of the fall by putting an end to sin, binding Satan, opening the gates of paradise, removing the flaming sword, and letting the righteous partake of the tree of life. Prior to entering the tabernacle or re-entering the Garden of Eden, certain rituals must be performed, such as being washed, anointed, and clothed in holy garments. As we read in one ancient Jewish midrash from the 8th to 9th century, quote, In the future, the Holy One will sit in the Garden of Eden. He takes the keys of Gehenna and gives them to Michael and Gabriel. Instantly, they go and open the gates of Gehenna and get hold of the hand of each one of the wicked and pull them up and wash them and anoint them with oil and heal them of the wounds of Gehenna and clothe them in beautiful and good garments and take them by their hand and bring them before the Holy One, all spruced and cleaned up. And when they reach the gate of the Garden of Eden, first Gabriel and Michael enter and take counsel with the Holy One. The Holy One answers them and says, Let them enter and see my glory. The future paradisal world, the light of God's presence, and the tree of life, as symbolized by the menorah, are all connected and accessed as one passes through the eastern gates of the Garden of Eden and Temple. The menorah in particular is often called a stylized tree of life, which is connected to immortality. Similar to the Mormon terrestrial room, the Jewish temple altar of incense and its rising smoke at the veil was symbolic of prayers ascending to God. In fact, it is not by happenstance that both the burning of incense at the golden altar and the appointed time of prayer at the temple occurred at the same time. John's apocalyptic vision reaffirms the symbolic relationship between prayer and the burning of incense in the temple. The Messianic paradisical era is found in the Catholic nave. As Catholic initiates move from the narthex to the nave, they symbolically re-enter the earthly paradise once lost by Adam, but now regained by Christ. Many Gothic and Romanesque entry portals depict Jesus Christ as the gatekeeper who opens the doors of paradise to the penitent. In Catholicism, Jesus' birth and resurrection from the dead allow mankind to enter past the doors of paradise into the nave of the church. In fact, during Easter week, the great door to the altar remains open during the entire service. This symbolism is also invoked in the Christmas Eve ritual when the Pope opens the Porta Santa, or Holy Door, at St. Peter's during the Jubilee year. According to St. Gregory the Great, the sacred blood of Christ has quenched the flaming sword that barred access to the tree of life. The Christian people are invited to share the riches of paradise. Vegetal forms are not simply re reproduced as they exist in nature, writes Dennis McNamara, but are given an overlay of geometric perfection. The ceilings, vault, vaults, and ribs recall a perfected canopy of trees. The nave recalls and fulfills the garden of the temple of Solomon's holy place, he writes.
in many instances, we find this sim symbolism. In Second Enoch, remember, we read that paradise is in between the corruptible or fallen earth and the incorruptible heaven, just as the nave is in between the apse and the courtyard. But as Hugh Nibley points out, one enters and leaves this world by a pleasant garden, even as one enters it by the Eden and moves on to the next world through the anapausis or refrigerium of the early Christians. Before wooden confessional booths were prescribed, individuals would confess at the wooden chancel screen towards the most holy place or sanctuary. This makes reference to the ancient Jewish temple veil and the symbolic veil scene of the Mormon temple where a candidate appears before God who alone can forgive sins. The final cosmic episode is the perfected heavenly realm. In this episode, we find several themes in common among the religions. This includes God's presence, the ark as a throne, light, and references to a heavenly paradise. The Mormon endowment spatial sequence comes to an end as the initiates pass through the temple veil and enter a space representing the perfected heavenly realm. This space is given the name of the celestial room, since in Mormon theology, the celestial kingdom is the highest degree and glory of heaven. Entering the celestial room is a symbolic return to the presence of God, the place where the story of cosmic history and creation began. The architectural experience of the celestial room is much different than the other endowment rooms because of the doctrinal significance of the space. Light and verticality are used to symbolize the glory of God's celestial kingdom, often compared to the glory of the sun. Ultimately, the Messiah's atonement is what makes entrance into the celestial kingdom possible. This principle is reinforced in the Vesica Pisces shaped celestial room of the Washington DC temple. The concept of a heavenly paradise is reinforced with painted murals and stained glass depictions of gardens. The celestial room murals in the Idaho Falls, Idaho temple, for example, use vibrant tones to portray a heavenly garden peopled by familial groups dressed in white clothing. Several temples also incorporate stained glass windows depicting the tree of life in their celestial rooms to reaffirm John's apocalyptic vision that this tree is near God's heavenly throne. In the Jewish tradition, the perfected heavenly realm is symbolized by the temple's Holy of Holies, where the journey began. On the walls within the cube-shaped Holy of Holies are depictions of vegetation that help to reinforce the notion of a heavenly paradise. In fact, the cube shape is itself expressive of perfection, the perfection of deity, and the typical shape of the heavenly temple, writes John Lundquist. The Ark of the Covenant was placed in the geometric center of the room, reinforces, reinforcing God's precise, uh, presence in the midst or center of all his creations. On top of the Ark sat two cherubim. The location between the wings of the two cherubim, just above the Ark's lid, was significant as it marked the exact center of the cube-shaped room and symbolized God's heavenly temple. This sacred center was important in ancient Judaism as it marks the beginning and end, first and last, of all God's creations. According to the ancient Jewish Midrash, quote, 
just as the navel is found at the center of the human being, so the, so the land of Israel is found at the center of the world. Jerusalem is at the center of the land of Israel, and the temple is at the center of Jerusalem. The Holy of Holies is at the center of the temple. The ark is at the center of the Holy of Holies, and the foundation stone is in front of the ark, which spot is the foundation of the world. Close quote. Consequently, entering the Holy of Holies was entering God's presence in the heavenly realm, and the ark was the place of oracle and divine revelation. The Catholic architectural experience terminates in the sanctuary or chancel, which relates to the Jewish temple's Holy of Holies. Only the ordained clergy could enter this space, just as the Holy of Holies was reserved only for the high priest but once a year. The Catholic sanctuary thus stood for the heavenly paradise, which is the abode of God. The connections between the apse of the church and the temple's holy of holies is further solidified in the 9th century depiction of the Ark of the Covenant and cherubim figures in the Germigny Despress Oratorio in France. This understanding carries over into contemporary Catholic architecture, such as in the St. Cecilia Mother House Chapel of the Dominican Sisters in Tennessee, where the apse serves as the Holy of Holies with its altar, table, and cherubim. Reflecting once again on the Sistine's Chapel Holy of Holies, the scene behind the altar depicts the Last Judgment. Often a cross is placed in the apse of Catholic churches as a symbolic tree of life. This is precisely because in early Christian art, the cross replaces the tree of Eden and opens again the potential for eternal life and favor with God. This symbolism, similar to the Mormon stained glass windows in the celestial room, also builds upon John's apocalyptic vision of the tree of life. Also similar to Mormon celestial rooms in the Jewish Holy of Holies are the garden motifs found in apse mosaics and murals representing the heavenly paradise. In conclusion, the synchronic comparison between ritual experience, religious ideals, spatial sequence, and cosmic history clarifies the similarities among the three religions. Although the architectural configurations are formally and historically different, the Mormon temple experience has ties to the ancient Jewish temple's tripartite spatial sequence and cosmic symbolism of creation, paradise, fall, and atonement. Likewise, the Catholic narrative and eschatological meaning of the courtyard slash narthex as the fallen world before the Savior as well as the naves linked to Christ's second advent and millennial reign, and the heavenly realm of the sanctuary or apse, parallel closely Mormon ritual spaces and their symbolism. What is most evident in this comparative study is the cyclical and chiastic pattern of the plan of salvation and the importance of the Messiah's atonement. As Lee Grand Baker and Stephen Ricks observe, as one considers the ancient Israelite temple drama, and I would add the Mormon temple endowment and Catholic liturgy, one discovers a subtextual message that runs through the whole of it. That message is the overriding importance and eternal necessity of the Savior's atonement. The analysis presented in this study confirms how Lindsay Jones's interpretive model can enrich our understanding of the architectural experience for a specific typology of sacred space, such as the Mormon temple, 
when it is compared cross-culturally, non-historically, and interreligiously to other cases of sacred architecture. As we have discovered, rare and important connections between Mormonism, Judaism, and Catholicism are clarified as we reinterpret and interpret sacred architecture. Thank you.